plan was I wanted to kill as many women I thought were prostitutes as I possibly could. I thought I could kill as many of them as I wanted without getting caught. On November 5th, 2003, Gary Leon Ridgway pleaded guilty to murdering 48 women. He admitted he was the legendary Green River Killer, a serial murderer who held the Pacific Northwest captive to a rampage of killings that spanned almost two decades. And Mr. Ridgway, is it your desire to plead guilty to the 48 charges of aggravated murder in the first degree because you believe that you are guilty of each of those offenses? Yes. One by one, as the dates, locations, and names of his victims were read in court, Gary Ridgway impassively acknowledged each and every murder. For the death of Wendy Lee Caulfield. Guilty. For the death of Colleen R. Brockman. Guilty. For the death of Yvonne S. Antosh. Guilty. For the death of Patricia M. Barzak. Guilty. In his confession, Ridgway told police he murdered at least 90 women. So many that he literally could not keep track of their faces, their names, or sometimes even where he discarded their bodies. His victims were prostitutes and runaways who lived in and around Seattle, Washington. Some as young as 16 years old. Like many other serial killers, Ridgway targeted vulnerable people. And prostitutes are the most vulnerable of all. He is America's most prolific serial killer. And his first victims were found here on the Green River. Everybody was terrified. You know, I mean, these were places where we picnicked, where we swam, where children ran free up until this time when, you know, bodies start showing up. It began on July 15, 1982, when two children spotted a nude body floating below the pet bridge. Her name was Wendy Lee Caulfield, a 16-year-old runaway who had been strangled. Four weeks later, the nude strangled body of Deborah Bonner was found floating face down in the river. Once the killing started, everyone was rather mystified. I mean, they thought, is this the work of more than one person? And where does it begin and where does it end? And how could this be? I mean, they were all in the Green River. And the killings continued. Three days later, on August 15th, we were told by a rafter that he'd been floating down the river. He saw two, what he thought were mannequins, uh, alongside the river bank. And as he got closer, realized that they weren't mannequins, but indeed they were human bodies. Their names were Cynthia Hines and Marcia Chapman. They were submerged in chest deep water, held under by boulders. Both had been strangled. The thing that really stuck out in my mind was Marsha Chapman's hand. One of her arms were free and waving in the water, uh, kind of uh, saying to me, help, you know, here I am. It's a, an image in my mind that will never go away. As lead detective Dave Reichert made his way down the hill towards the bodies, he actually came upon another victim splayed in the tall grass. Her name was Opal Mills. At the time, Reichert didn't know that evidence recovered from these crime scenes would be instrumental in capturing the Green River Killer nearly 20 years later. But at the moment the victims were being dredged from the river, Ridgeway was just minutes away working at the Kenworth Truck Company in Seattle. By 1982, he'd been working there for 11 years. Gary was a painter and he was a taper. They taped the designs onto the trucks. It was a job that required neatness and precision, the ideal position for Gary Ridgway. 
meticulous. He wanted to make sure everything was just, just perfect to him. He may have been precise, but to many of his co-workers, something was not quite right about Gary Leon Ridgeway. When a woman walked by, most guys will look and they'll go kind of, hey, you know, but he just, he kind of like got lost in his thoughts. But no one suspected how different Gary Leon Ridgeway really was. As fall turned to winter in 1982, no one in Seattle had any idea as to the identity of the Green River Killer, even though he was hidden amongst them in plain sight. You know, he was really unremarkable until it was discovered that he had killed dozens of women. And that's part of the secret of his success. He looks and acts like everybody else, and he acts and looks like nobody in particular. So he gets away with it. Even 20 years later, many friends and neighbors still find it hard to believe. He's a wonderful person. He's the type of person you can walk up to and hug and say, hey, Gary, how are you doing? But if police had known more about Gary Ridgway's life, beginning with his childhood, they may not have been surprised that this hardworking family man was secretly the Green River Killer. In August of 1982, the bodies of the first victims of the Green River Killer were found. Fear quickly spread through the quiet suburbs that lined the river. My biggest fear, quite honestly, was being in the wrong place at the wrong time and somebody's getting ready to dump a body and here I am there to witness it. And that whole summer, any time you were in a car by yourself, there was police around asking you what you were doing. A major investigation of the murders was launched by Washington's King County Police and other local law enforcement agencies. They realized a serial killer was at work. He appeared to be targeting the streetwalkers who worked the strip, a notorious stretch of the Pacific Highway South that ran from SeaTac into Seattle. They make the perfect victim. They're getting into a car and they're trying to do it secretly because they don't want to get caught by the undercover police officer that might be watching. They don't want to get caught by the patrol officer driving by. So as far as victims go, uh, he picked easy targets. By the end of 1983, 13 bodies had been found and two dozen more women had been reported missing. Some of them were last seen in a pickup truck. The police followed every tip, including one that actually led to Gary Ridgway for the first time. A young woman named Marie Malvar disappeared. A witness saw her get into a pickup truck and later noticed the vehicle parked at Ridgway's house. The police interviewed Ridgway, who convinced them he was not their man. He has this unassuming, unintimidating demeanor. You could stand next to him in a grocery line. You would never, ever expect that this is the Green River Killer. Ridgeway's life began in unremarkable circumstances. Born in Salt Lake City, Utah, on February 18, 1949, he was the second of Mary and Thomas Ridgeway's three sons. In 1960, the family moved to Washington State. They settled into a small three-bedroom house in McMicken Heights, which is now part of the city of SeaTac. Our neighborhood was like a working-class neighborhood. A lot of kids in the neighborhood, and we all kind of played together and walked to school together. Ridgeway's father was a metro bus driver whose route was the Pacific Highway south into Seattle. It went through the infamous Strip, where Gary would later find so many of his victims. At home, the Ridgeways seemed the typical suburban family. Gary's father enjoyed running garage sales, while his mother was an avid gardener. Loved to work on the garden. Always was saying hello, always pleasant. Always wore that straw hat of hers, always out in the, cutting the trees down or pruning or whatever, always did that. But Ridgeway would later share other memories of his mother. 
he was a bedwetter into his early teens and recalls her washing his genitals. He developed intense feelings of lust towards his mother mixed with humiliation. He talked about gazing on her as she sunbathed and he had sexual fantasies about her. Almost in the same breath, Mr. Ridgway would say that he felt rage toward his mother, that he wanted to kill her. Most serial killers have a rich fantasy life that involves sexuality and violence fused together so that they come to believe that they can't have one without the other. Uh, and the first time that they kill, it may even be on a lark. This seemed to be the case when Ridgway acted on one homicidal urge when he was 16 and came upon a six-year-old boy playing cowboy. Ridgway lured the boy to a wooded area. There, he pulled out a pocket knife and stabbed the child. The boy was stunned, and Mr. Ridgway, according to the boy, and Mr. Ridgway admits this, said, I just wanted to see what it felt like to kill someone. And Mr. Ridgway laughed and walked away. The boy survived, and Ridgway was never identified as the attacker. He admitted indulging in other kinds of aberrant behavior. He dabbled in arson, he said. Uh, he said he suffocated a cat. Yet Ridgway seemed anything but a threatening personality while attending Taiyi High School. In fact, he made quite an impression on one schoolmate. I thought he was pretty cute. <laughs> um, I could even say I had a little crush on him back then. His eyes and his smile are the things that I remember the most about Gary. When he would smile, his dimples would show and his eyes would kind of sparkle. But Ridgway was a poor student, pulling mostly D's in his classwork. He had an IQ in the low 80s and had to repeat a year twice. Ridgway socialized with other teens at the local community club where dances were held every Saturday. But on one occasion, he had a run-in with a boy from his school. He actually peed on my brother's leg in the restroom. Gary made a rude comment and my brother told him to take it back and Gary turned around and peed on his leg and then my brother hit him so we all got kicked out of the dance and had to go home early that night. In June of 1969, Ridgway graduated from Taiyi High School at the age of 20. That August, he enlisted in the Navy. The following summer, he was married to Claudia Craig, a young woman he'd been dating for several years. Soon after, Ridgway shipped out for a six-month tour in the Western Pacific. They spent time visiting various ports, including the Philippines, where apparently he uh, uh, visited prostitutes. Ridgway paid a high price for his sexual encounters, venereal disease. Naval medical records show that Ridgway was diagnosed with gonorrhea. He blamed the prostitutes for infecting him. Then, on his return to the States, he found that his wife had betrayed him. He discovered that Claudia had had an affair with somebody else, and he was very upset. He said, my first wife turned into a whore. Ridgway's marriage came to an end, but his hatred for prostitutes, which he would later act on, was just beginning. By 1972, he was back in SeaTac. Single again and honorably discharged from the Navy, he got a full-time job painting designs on trucks at the local Kenworth plant. To those who met him, he seemed like an average Joe. They had no way of knowing he was becoming the devil in disguise. In 1972, Gary Ridgway was still a killer in the making. He had gone astray as a young man, but at least as far as investigators know, he had not yet committed murder. The triggers that would detonate his life as a serial killer had yet to fully fall into place. But over the next few years, they finally would. We look so carefully. Uh, in our quest to understand serial murder, at what happened to the killer when he was a child. 
But there's something that we ignore, and that is making the transition into adulthood and middle age. By age 22, Gary Ridgway was already in a deep emotional hole. He'd gone through a bitter divorce from a woman he'd come to think of as a whore. He was angry, but that didn't mean he was going to be lonely. Sitting at home without a woman around was not Gary's style. When people think of a serial killer, they tend to think of a loner who is unable to have a relationship, who can't hold a full-time job. But the truth is just the opposite, and Ridgeway is a perfect example. Just months after he and Claudia divorced, there already was someone else. Ridgeway met a woman named Marsha Winslow at a popular singles hangout. Within a year, Gary and Marsha were man and wife. She met his needs. Uh, she was initially very subservient. She cooked for him. She uh, provided sexual activity whenever he wanted it. They enjoyed sex anywhere and everywhere. Especially outdoors, in the gorgeous scenery of western Washington state. Gary liked to have sex outdoors in a variety of places along the Green River and the tall grass there and uh, various locations along highways. He would just pull off the road and, said, and, and have sex. Later, those locations would be the dumping grounds for the women he killed. But at the time, life seemed to be looking up for Gary Ridgway until 1975, when Marcia gave birth to a boy they named Matthew. Mr. Ridgway was not particularly uh, fond of having a child. It changed his relationship with his wife. She wasn't as available to him. She had a period of time when she was unable to have sexual intercourse. And over time, when they did have relations, his demeanor began to change. Where there once had been playful frolics by the river, there now was a creepy side to the way he approached her. He was in the habit of uh, sneaking up behind her and frightening her. And apparently, uh, his idea of foreplay on some occasions was to uh, choke her, as he called it, grabbing her around the neck, uh, compressing her neck, interfering with her breathing. Marsha walked out and got a divorce. And if Gary Ridgway thought life was bad when his first marriage ended, he felt even worse when Marsha split. Years later, he would tell the cops that losing Marsha was a point of no return. He felt he had been done wrong. He said that he should have killed her, and it seemed that after that, that's when uh, the rampage began. Ridgway argued, you know, if I had only killed my second wife, I would never have killed these prostitutes. You know, I was really trying to get her. It's easy not to believe Ridgway's claim. People close to the case think he would have killed sooner or later anyway. But whatever his true motive, a bit more than a year after Ridgway's divorce, the bodies of young women started turning up alongside the Green River. I remember when the first victim was found, we actually thought that perhaps it was domestic violence, some sort of isolated case, and then here comes another one and another one. And there was just a feeling of dismay, of disbelief. Nobody else knew it at the time, but the killer was Gary Ridgway. The victims were women who in his mind were as easy to hate as the wives who had left him. He regarded women who were prostitutes as totally expendable and less than human. In fact, he told police that he regarded them as garbage. He would take them to his house or one of those secluded spots near the river where he'd once made love to Marsha. Then he'd make sure they were completely naked so the victim's clothes would contain no evidence of the crime. Then, it was usually a forearm around the neck, without warning, from behind. It was up close and personal, lots of physical contact. He would literally squeeze the last gasp of breath from his dying victim's body. And the more that she pled and begged and screamed, the better he felt about himself. And he compounded his excitement later. Sex with the victim before the crime wasn't enough. 
so he'd often return to the riverbank where he dumped his victims and fornicate again with the corpses. He created a system of burying them near where he could get at them and having use them and reuse them until there were maggots or flies there. That's having sex until they almost deteriorate. Frankly, I don't know the psychological reasons behind uh, what he did, but according to Mr. Ridgway, at least, his reasoning was that it was simply free. It was a date, a sexual act that he did not have to pay for. Once Gary Ridgway tasted the thrill of murder, he found it irresistible. There's no doubt in my mind that he thoroughly enjoyed the killing, and the more he did it, the more he enjoyed it. And all the while, he was acting as father to a son barely seven years old. Though he wasn't thrilled when Matthew was born, over the years they started spending more time together. After the divorce, he had Matthew every other weekend, and he shamelessly used that fact to reel in his victims. In the house where he did many of his killings, you could put someone at ease by saying, oh, here's my son's room, and, it, and there's toys, and, and why would a guy with a son, he's not going to hurt me. It shows you just how crafty he was. Uh, he was able to use his son as a ploy to, to assure his victim that he was innocuous, that he was harmless. Matthew even met at least one victim. The boy was in the truck when Ridgway took her to a secluded spot in the woods. He drove her to a remote location, told the boy to stay in the truck, and then he disappeared into the woods with the woman and then came back without her. And his little boy asked, you know, well, Dad, where's the girl? And he said, oh, she walked home. She lives near here. Ridgway didn't care at all about his son. You know, it's, it's, you know, use people, use them as instruments to meet his needs. He did that with his son, he did that with his wives, and he certainly did that with his victims. By January 1984, the body count along the Green River was up to 13. A desperate police force tried to put the pieces together and find the killer. For Gary Ridgway, the game of evasion was just beginning. There was little to celebrate in Seattle as the new year began in 1984. For nearly two years, the Green River Killer had methodically murdered one young woman after another. The body count stood at 13, and King County Sheriff's detectives were growing frustrated. It is challenging. Uh, there, is, uh, there is a perpetrator out there, there's a killer on the loose, who has evaded our efforts to apprehend him. Within a month, those efforts were enhanced with the formation of the Green River Task Force. The 50-person unit assembled a massive list of suspects from tips called into a hotline, from known sex offenders, and from every other possible source. But just the sheer volume of what we had, 12 to 15,000 suspects. You had priests in women's underwear out there, you had child counselors out there with kitty porn. There are a lot of men who, at the end of the day, take off their tie, go out to the strip, and they're looking for something kinky. One of those men was Gary Ridgway. Uh, Ridgway's plan was pure and simple. Make a deal with uh, a young lady on the street, whisk them away in his truck, and they are never to be seen again. Well, Mr. Ridgway thought about killing all of the time. It was basically every waking moment. When he ate, when he slept, when he even probably made love to his wife, he was thinking of killing and abusing a woman in the woods. That's his day. And once his thoughts were put into action... He was a perfect killing machine, in my opinion. He didn't have a conscience. Uh, he enjoyed what he was doing. It was a game, and he was winning. One ploy that Ridgway used to keep police guessing, he frequently repainted the various pickup trucks he used to cruise the strip. Hoping to stop the killer's winning streak, members of the task force wanted to get inside the mind of this serial killer. They even sought the opinion of another prolific serial killer who once stalked the Pacific Northwest, Ted Bundy. 
he had written us a letter and said, why don't you come down and talk to me? I think I can help you understand the mind of the river man, as he called Ridgeway. He said he's probably attracted to pornography. He likes the hunt, he likes the power and authority over his victims. He will go back and he'll have sex with the dead bodies. And certainly that gave us an insight that we, that we didn't have before. In fact, the position of some of the bodies led investigators to suspect that the Green River Killer was revisiting his corpses for sex. A few bodies were found with rocks placed inside their sexual organs. But Ridgway was leaving no real clues behind. Each time the remains of a potential victim were discovered, investigators poured over the crime scene, collecting evidence, looking for the tiniest clue. What were we looking for? Anything. Potential hair transfers, paint chips, um, glass, um, clothing damage, you know, any, anything. The collection of evidence continued once the bodies were sent for autopsy, where the medical examiner was able to retrieve semen from some of them. Slowly, carefully, the evidence was being stored away that might someday identify the elusive Green River Killer, who always seemed to be one step ahead of his pursuers. Everything we did as a task force was, of course, uh, reported. So it was reported on the news that we were going to have surveillance. So he would visit one site and place a victim, and then go to a different site and place a victim. He learned a lot from all of us, unfortunately. But Ridgway's deceptive talents did not mean he was invisible to the police. Police knew he was a frequent customer of the women on the strip. He was uh, called in by the task force on several different occasions to be interviewed. And even though he had killed a woman three weeks before one of the major interviews by the task force, he displayed no signs of nervousness. Ridgway's composure even allowed him to pass a polygraph test. A polygraph test is based upon one's guilty emotions. And if you don't ever feel guilty about what you've done, uh, you're going to be able to uh, pull the wool over somebody's eyes. But Ridgway couldn't completely fool task force detectives. In 1987, he came under even more scrutiny. Once again, it was the pickup trucks he drove while trolling for victims that drew detectives to him. The deeper we looked at Ridgeway, the more it became obvious that he was available for every single one of those appearance dates. We were working on credit card records, every single place where he bought gas, and we checked out how many miles it would take to drive to and from work every day and how much that would normally burn up. Well, he was burning up many, many gallons of gas way beyond, and that's just what he was charged. We had a couple of witnesses when they were shown the photo montage containing Ridgeway's photo, they would say, well, it looks a lot like this one and point to his picture. Prosecutors and detectives thought about arresting Ridgeway. But we didn't have anywhere near enough to make a conviction because it was all circumstantial. Investigators got a warrant to search Ridgeway's house hoping to find physical evidence that proved he was the killer. But the search came up empty. Mr. Ridgway was simply very good at what he did. Uh, according to Mr. Ridgway, he killed all of the women in his bedroom. His practice was as soon as he finished killing them, he would often take the sheets off his bed, throw them in the washer even before he left with the woman's body and dumped it out at a scene. So he left behind nothing, essentially. Once again, Gary Ridgway slipped free from the law. And I think he starts playing more of a game of moving pieces around. He's moving skeletons around. He's moving bodies around. He did change his MO. He was taking bodies further out into the woods or the mountains because he didn't want their bodies found. Free to visit the ever-widening areas where his victims were discarded, Gary Ridgway continued to hunt and kill, convinced nothing could ever stop him. 
By 1988, more than 40 women had vanished in what had come to be known as the Green River Killings. And the killer, Gary Ridgway, was still on the loose. At this point, Ridgway wasn't just evading the police. He was hiding his murderous ways so well that yet another woman agreed to become his wife. Ridgway married wife number three, Judith Lynch, in 1988. When they first moved here, they were newlyweds. Their eyes sparkled, they were always smiling, and they were always happy, and you just never seen them apart, ever. But love and marriage did not end Ridgway's insatiable desire to kill. He continued to murder, while managing to keep his new wife completely unaware. He could be Gary Ridgway, the husband, and drive off in the truck and become Gary Ridgway the killer and come back home and be the husband again and, and never give her any reason to think he was anything but that. He had his killing career that he did out of sight from any other people and he had the rest of his life where he was a father and he was a husband and he was an employee. There was an inkling at the Kenworth truck plant where Ridgway had worked for years that he was hiding something. After all, his co-workers knew that police had questioned him in the mid-1980s. We had the unique experience of having to work next to him, always thinking, could he be or couldn't he be? And everybody had their own opinions. Some people thought he was, some people thought he wasn't. You wouldn't want to have a beer with him, you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't want him to uh, come over to your house. Uh, he, just, he, he just was a different type of a person. Some employees at Kenworth even gave him a nickname. Green River Gary. Little did they know what he was doing to them. Ridgway later told investigators that once in a while he would use jewelry that he'd stolen from his victims to play a joke on his co-workers. He put the jewelry in places uh, where people could find them where he worked. When one of the employees picked it up, put it on and had a real good find. In Gary's mind, I think he walked very quietly and had a little smirk on his face and there was a big smile inside of him reminding him of the young ladies he killed. And that isn't all he apparently did with his victim's possession. He had huge garage sales and he'd have just gob stuff. I guess the kind of funny thing I always saw was a lot of jewelry, a lot of young girls jewelry and a lot of mixed pairs of shoes. Gary Bridgeway was sure that he had his neighbors, his co-workers, the cops, and everyone else completely fooled. But I think uh, after a while, he was winning the game. And he says, hey, I'm doing pretty good. So well, in fact, that the police investigation was forced to slow down. Though Ridgeway was still killing, far fewer bodies were being found. As the case dragged on with no resolution, the investigation task force steadily got smaller and smaller. By 1990, there were five of us left. I left in April of 90, there's four left. By 1992, Tom Jensen's the only guy left. I tried to keep it alive as best I could in the mind of the public. It began to seem hopeless until modern technology gave investigators some help they desperately needed. Back in the 80s, detectives had painstakingly taken samples from crime scenes. They didn't even know what good it might do, but they cataloged it and stored it anyway. They refrigerated and preserved it because, uh, you know, sometimes there's, uh, people can say, well, this is not doing anything good. It's just taking up room in our uh, evidence room. Let's, let's get rid of it. But that didn't happen. Their foresight didn't begin to pay off until the summer of 2001 when DNA technology was finally good enough to analyze that evidence from the 80s. 19 years after a woman named Marcia Chapman was strangled and left to rot on the banks of the Green River, samples taken when her body was discovered went to the Washington State Patrol Crime Lab. There was spermatozoa there and we were able to generate a male DNA typing profile that matched Gary Ridgway. It's really amazing the profiles we got. Then they tested samples from victim Carol Christensen. Again, a match with Ridgway. For all those years, Gary Ridgway had gotten away with murder. Finally, the cops had the proof they needed to nail him. 
we had tears in our eyes. It, it was a great moment. Uh, one I won't forget. And there was even more good news on the way. New techniques could now identify microscopic particles of paint collected years earlier at the crime scenes. And scientists were able to link them directly to Ridgeway. We find out there's spray paint, which was chemically identical at least, to the, to the material that Gary Ridgeway was working with at the plant where he worked. He was bringing paint particles unbeknownst to him into his vehicle, into his home, and if victims were in his vehicle in his home, those would be transferred as well. And this is where Ridgeway wasn't thinking very clearly, as paint samples matched exactly. With evidence in hand, the task force would soon put an end to Gary Ridgeway's reign of terror. For nearly 20 years, Gary Ridgeway found perverse pleasure in murdering dozens of women and getting away with it. He became America's most prolific serial killer. The insignificant boy who was a failure in school found satisfaction in outsmarting an army of investigators. We didn't hold him when we had him in 87. We didn't hold him when he was contacted in 84 uh, and 83. So he, he had to have felt that he was, he was winning. But on November 30th, 2001, the game ended for Gary Ridgeway. DNA evidence tied him to four Green River victims, and he was arrested at his home. One of my neighbors came rapping on the door, and he said, hey, Clem, did you see who they arrested? And they had the picture of Gary back on the TV. And I said, you got to be kidding. Ridgeway, the Green River killer. When I heard and saw the picture of Gary on the news, my heart stopped and my stomach went into the biggest knot. I was so shocked. Despite the clear physical evidence linking him to these crimes, Ridgeway protested his innocence. His family stood by him and refused to believe the worst. They stuck with him, they visited him weekly, his brothers, their wives, his son, and they were quite concerned and quite convinced that this was all wrong, that Gary couldn't have done this. Ridgeway's wife, Judith, also remained loyal as long as she could. She was standing by him and was in total disbelief, assuming that they had the wrong person, it couldn't be. And then as evidence began to come out, uh, eventually uh, they separated and, and she now has nothing else to do with him. On November 5th, 2003, all doubt of Ridgeway's guilt was erased. He pleaded guilty to the murders of 48 women. He'd made a deal to cooperate with the prosecution to provide more information on his victims and the whereabouts of their remains. In doing so, he avoided a trial and possible death penalty. Mr. Ridgeway, how do you plead to the charge of aggravated murder in the first degree as charged in count one for the death of Wendy Lee Caulfield? Guilty. How do you plead to the charge of aggravated murder in the first degree as charged in count two? Guilty. 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 It's like he didn't have any remorse at all for what he had done. You know, he'd killed so many people, he didn't remember who they were, what they looked like. I just couldn't believe that somebody could kill all those people and not remember them. Neither could the angry relatives of his victims, who were invited to speak in court when Ridgeway was sentenced to life without parole on December 18, 2003. You had said your memory, when it comes to all of the women you took, was gone. Our memory is not. In your words, you said that they didn't mean anything to you, but she meant everything to us. She was a mother, she was a wife, she was a sister, and we miss her. Gary Ridgway sat there stone-faced as victims' relatives damned him and mocked him. He's an animal. I wish for him to have a long, suffering, cruel death. He's gonna go to hell and that's where he belongs. But then the emotionless facade finally cracked when the father of one of his victims appeared to surprise him with a dose of human kindness. 
Mr. Ridgeway. Um, there are people here that hate you. I'm not one of them. You've, you've made it difficult to live up to what I believe, and that is what God says to do, and that's to forgive. You are forgiven, sir. Those tears and a statement he made to the court later that day were as close to showing real remorse as Gary Ridgway had ever come. I'm sorry for killing these ladies. They had their whole lives ahead of themselves, ahead of them. I'm sorry for causing so much pain to so many families. To me, this was all about the victims and the devastation he did, not about him. Uh, you know, he, he should definitely die for what he did. But that would, that would do nothing for all those victims. And there's many, many victims. There's no sense of victory in this. I'm just glad that he stopped. And it may be that no one except Gary Ridgway himself can ever unlock the secret of what drove him to become the Green River Serial Killer. In a way, it's sort of like trying to speculate about the mental life of a snake. Mr. Ridgway is a predator, first and foremost. And ultimately, at least from my perspective, you can't come up with a more coherent explanation of why he killed than to answer simply because he could. On the next Cold Case Files, three abused sisters. My mother put me in a deep freezer and locked me in there. Two of them found dead. It was a horrible scene. Could their own mother really be their killer? I knew I was next. Cold Case Files, tonight at 9 on a and &E. Catch Crossing Jordan, Monday to Thursday at 11 on a and &E. plan was I wanted to kill as many women I thought were prostitutes as I possibly could. I thought I could kill as many of them as I wanted without getting caught. On November 5th, 2003, Gary Leon Ridgway pleaded guilty to murdering 48 women. He admitted he was the legendary Green River Killer, a serial murderer who held the Pacific Northwest captive to a rampage of killings that spanned almost two decades. And Mr. Ridgway, is it your desire to plead guilty to the 40... Floating below the pet bridge. Her name was Wendy Lee Caulfield, a 16-year-old runaway who had been strangled. Four weeks later, the nude strangled body of Deborah Bonner was found floating face down in the river. Once the killing started, everyone was rather mystified. I mean, they thought, is this the work of more than one person? And where does it begin and where does it end? And how could this be? I mean, they were all in the Green River. And the killings continued. Three days later, on August 15th, we were told by a rafter that he'd been floating down the river. He saw two, what he thought were mannequins, uh, alongside the river bank. And as he got closer, realized that they weren't mannequins, but indeed they were human bodies. The eight charges of aggravated murder in the first degree, because you believe that you are guilty of each of those offenses. Yes. One by one, as the dates, locations, and names of his victims were read in court, Gary Ridgway impassively acknowledged each and every murder. For the death of Wendy Lee Caulfield. Guilty. For the death of Colleen R. Brockman. Guilty. For the death of Yvonne S. Antosh. Guilty. For the death of Patricia M. Barzak. Guilty. 
In his confession, Ridgway told police he murdered at least 90 women. So many that he literally could not keep track of their faces, their names, or sometimes even where he discarded their bodies. Their names were Cynthia Hines and Marcia Chapman. They were submerged in chest-deep water, held under by boulders. Both had been strangled. The thing that really stuck out in my mind was Marcia Chapman's hand. One of her arms were free and waving in the water, uh, kind of uh, saying to me, help, you know, here I am. It's a, an image in my mind that will never go away. As lead detective Dave Reichert made his way down the hill towards the bodies, he actually came upon another victim splayed in the tall grass. Her name was Opal Mills. At the time, Reichert didn't know that evidence recovered from these crime scenes. His victims were prostitutes and runaways who lived in and around Seattle, Washington. Some as young as 16 years old. Like many other serial killers, Ridgeway targeted vulnerable people. And prostitutes are the most vulnerable of all. He is America's most prolific serial killer. And his first victims were found here on the Green River. Everybody was terrified. You know, I mean, these were places where we picnicked, where we swam where children ran free up until this time when, you know, bodies start showing up. It began on July 15, 1982, when two children spotted a nude body 